Hi everybody, my name is Jason Boss and I am a researcher and I'm a Torah keeper and I am honored to have with me Miss Trisha Elliott. Miss Trisha Elliott has been a Hallelujah Scriptures employee, was a Hallelujah Scriptures employee for a while. As I was doing my investigation of the Hallelujah Scriptures, which I've investigated for a 13 year period, I have run across many, many people. I have run across many people who are ex-postal agents. And as I was investigating this and I was trying to find out the criminality of the Hallelujah Scriptures and exactly how evil they were, I ran into Trisha Elliott. And Trisha Elliott and her family is a very amazing family that has been doing some amazing stuff. And for those who have not heard our very first interview, guys, I will link this up at the very bottom. I don't want to um, re-scrape up stuff that has already been presented. I want to get as cling information as we can. And last time we got cut off, like we were in the middle and, and Trish is in the middle of a forest and there's only one spot she can be. And so we are honored to have her. And right now, Miss Trisha Elliott, how are you doing? Doing well, thank you. Um, I would like to um, first off say thank you to everyone that has donated um, to the GoFundMe to support our family through this. It has taken care of essential needs. We had a very dire family emergency that it helped to cover along with our food and, and animal feeding. And I was in the middle of thanking everyone for that and didn't realize until I heard the other interview that it had cut off, our, my signal had cut off before I even got to that. So I do want to say that very first to everyone who has donated uh, to us. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We have uh, prayed for everyone who has donated personally, and we ask that Yahuwah multiply your gifts back to you because it has meant a lot. Like, I can't even go into... The details of it at the moment but it was we have we had a true true emergency and it, it has meant the world to me personally so thank you to everyone beautiful and for those who do not know miss trisha elliott and her family her, her wonderful children they are right now what you would call a state of homeless they still have a home but they went and they took a job for the hallelujah scriptures and they were essentially coaxed over there and they were left to the wolves. And the Hallelujah Scriptures, violating their contract, kicked them out, essentially trying to, what they were trying to do is they were trying to hide the evidence of what Trisha had uncovered. And the story of Trish is extremely important to all of this investigation because this ties in a tremendous amount of things. And Trish, one question, I, I, let, me, let me start with the first thing, is... Um, there was something that a lot of people have questions on is after you had an assault happen to you on a Shabbat where you had what we don't know. We only have a part of the picture, but we have what it looked like is it looked like a guy was breaking into your house on a Shabbat. We know what happens to the point where he almost gets through the door. Can you explain exactly what happened what happened when he made it through that door and how did that situation go down? Because that's something we do not have closure on. Okay. Yes. Um, the, the video the, that we were able to provide where we had had a phone call, uh, attempt at the Matthew 18 process with the president, Robert Lou Griffith. And, uh, he was on the phone and then we had Greg Murray, and then David, whose last name I don't know, in person, um, they were they had spent the night before, which was a Thursday night, um, inside the warehouse, which is where all the scriptures were housed, and it was right outside my bedroom and bathroom apartment in there. And they had spent the night in the warehouse, drinking, talking, staying up late. I wasn't even comfortable being in there <clears throat> that Thursday night, and so I stayed in the house and slept on a love seat in the, the little house where uh, my daughter Olympia was. And my cousin Aaron had talked to them. They said they weren't gonna move out of the warehouse. And then we had that phone call, which happened right as the call was starting on Friday night. And um, Robert had told me in text that he would tell them to go and get accommodations in town, get a motel, because I explained that I was very uncomfortable that way, because it's not private. There's a big, great, in the door that you can see through very easily and again <clears throat> my bathroom is there well 
well, that night, that Friday night, as, as Shabbat was beginning, they told us that they were not leaving, that they were setting up a tent in the yard. And so that's what they did. And I did go into my room, but I wasn't able to sleep because our wood pile is right behind there, right outside my bedroom window. And Greg just kept, at least, it was at least once an hour as I was checking. They had also, they cut off the Wi-Fi, they took the modem out of the warehouse. So I had absolutely no contact with any message my son who was sleeping right outside in right outside of Ryan and all night long every time I would be just about to go to sleep I would hear the yelling again and I'd go look out the window and it was Greg and he was he didn't sleep all night and he would walk back and pick up like two pieces of wood from the wood pile and walk back around he was yelling flailing his arms looked like he was having an argument with the trees I mean it was it was really bizarre all night long and it finally stopped around, I want to say, 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning at some point in there. And they uh, they weren't in the warehouse. They were out at their campsite, and it got quiet. So I thought, well, maybe they finally fell asleep since he had been up all night. And I don't know about the other two men. I only saw David a couple times in the night, and I didn't see Bryce. That was the first name of the other guy. that I don't know anything else about him. But um, So then I finally felt like I would, like if they were quiet and staying over in their campsite that I could get cleaned up. So I hadn't been able to do my laundry or anything with all of the chaos and everything that had been going on. And so that was when I realized I didn't have anything to change into. So I was spot cleaning some of my shirts and had gone into my bathroom to take a shower. To do that, I locked the side door to the warehouse so that no one would come busting in because they, they would just come in and open the door like they didn't knock or anything. So I locked it so that I could get cleaned up, and this was sometime between 8 and 9 that morning, and I was in the shower. I had just gotten out of the shower, but I was still in the bathroom when I heard banging, and uh, didn't know what it was, so I grabbed a towel and went and looked out. That's when that's where I got the video of him trying to break in the window, of David trying mm-hmm. to break in the window, and he wouldn't stop. I stopped the video trying to get a hold of my son and my cousin. I was yelling for help. They couldn't hear me. None of them could hear me. And so I go back to the bathroom to grab my things, and someone started, I didn't see who it was, but one of them started kicking in the side door. The side door is right next to the bathroom, and my room is just beyond that. They kicked the door in. I, I grabbed a towel and wrapped it around myself, hurried up and put my skirt back on, and they kicked the door in just like two seconds as I rounded the corner and got into my room. Wow. And I got my door locked, and I was shaking too much to finish getting dressed, and I yelled for help again, and that was when my son Clinton had heard me yelling from the back because he walks around the back from his where he sleeps. He walks around the back of the warehouse to go to the house, and he heard me, so he came in, and... He wasn't sure who had kicked the door in, but he said Greg was the one that was in there opening the bay doors. So he saw Greg and David both in there, but he thinks it might have been Greg that kicked the door in. Again, we didn't actually see that, but one of them did. And uh, then when I heard, when he came to my door, my son Clinton, when he came to my door and I knew he was there, um, I told him to stay there while I finished getting dressed, and then then he walked me into the house. Um, after that, which is where I talked to my cousin Aaron, and that's when I found out that um, he had Greg on video where he was threatening to call CPS on them and said that we weren't homeschooling our kids and all of that, that whole video of that. That was the time that all of it was happening. Uh, but if I, had, if I had been two seconds slower, I would have been hit in the back by that door as they kicked it in. Like, I would have been on my face on the floor <laughs> without my clothes on. Like, it was it was terrifying. I, I was so shaken, literally, the physically shaking that I couldn't even use my phone or anything, and 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 I didn't go back in and get any of my stuff. Um, Aaron and my boys went and got some of the stuff that was in my room and got my bed out of there after the police got here. Um, again, that the Hallelujah Scriptures people called the police. I don't know if Greg called them or if it was um, Danny, which is his wife, I think. 
don't know. It's his, it's his girl. It's his girlfriend. It, he, yeah, it's his girlfriend. Okay. He, yep. Yeah, so, I know he was on the, her part of the time, so I don't know which one of them it was that called and then the police showed up out here that Shabbat, and so we explained everything. I the I just let the sheriff come inside to talk to me because I didn't even get my shoes. My shoes were in my room. Everything was in there, <clears throat> and uh, yeah. So that's how <laughs> that's how all of that happened. Wow. That, yes, that was Shabbat. Yeah, that is one incredible Shabbat time that um, you probably never had a day like that, and you probably never had a day since. And what did you, what were your thoughts on this happening on a Shabbat? Uh, that, you know, most people have seen the Hallelujah Scriptures, and, and the Hallelujah Scriptures has this facade of being this holy, holy people. But when you actually investigate it, they're, it's, it's 180 degrees different. In fact, they're, I would have to say they're de ex demonic. I mean, they're, they're extremely demonic. Um, the actions of Deborah Weiss and or Wessel, however, whatever her name is, and her husband, and along with the people they sent, you know, representing the Hallelujah Scriptures, these people brought drugs, guns, and violence, yeah. and they attacked you guys. Did did yeah. uh, what what did your kids think of all this? I mean, what was what was the have they ever seen anything like this? No, not no, no. bathroom that they that I was actively using that they were insisting they needed and that's why they supposedly broke in. No sense because everyone else is awake. There's a bathroom in the camper, there's a bathroom in the house, there's a little toilet out by where they can work Greg said that before when they came to buy the house and uh, the after postal agents were here that he didn't even go in there, that he used the woods that rushing it and like I don't understand why they had to have the bathroom that I was actively in use of. It made no sense. Um, it was it was all out of anger and and it's not the way that people who serve Yah act, especially on Shabbat, but any time at any day, um, to try to force someone out of the bathroom they're actually using. It's not it's not as if I was trying to prevent them from using the restroom or that we were trying to not be hospitable. That's not a all. I had waited all night long in case they, they did need the bathroom. Right. And didn't lock the door the whole night. It wasn't until they got quiet and I thought that, you know, I would finally have some privacy. But even then, like, all he would have say, ask my cousin, like, hey, is there another bathroom we can use? Because she's using that one. I, it, it's baffling to me. It was pure, it was pure hatred is what it felt like. And, it, yeah, it, that was when I started. Like I already, I had already um, proof of the criminality. I really didn't, I really didn't expect that level of hatred from Greg and Robert. Just the interactions we had had with them before, when they could visit us the first time, um, they were very kind and respectful, and like they they would knock. They didn't use our. They use the warehouse bathroom even. They use the camper, and I just, I don't okay. know. I don't understand it, people who, who think that that's okay. Yeah, that, okay. That Yeah, that seemed extremely unmanly to me, ungentlemanlike, and more demonology. Now, let's switch gears real quick. We taught, we've touched on this before, but I want to get a, a statement. The... I believe, this is my personal opinion, that the Hallelujah Scriptures is a criminal enterprise. That they're not just doing crime here and there, but that they have a, a that, that everything that they're doing from their fake orphans, widows, and lepers to their fake, to them not shipping a lot of prisoners' letters, it feels like a criminal enterprise. Can you give me your two cents on a complete understanding of what you believe that you have encountered with the Hallelujah Scriptures. Who are these people, and what should people expect from them? It, they're, they are definitely a criminal organization, without a doubt. Any of, the, any of the lower level people, postal agents and such, that they have working for them, they do a lot of vetting to make sure that those people are legit and sincerely want to serve the Father. Um, and they put, they have them put their names on him. That's what they have done. They did that with us. Um, they do everything in such a shady way. And I have been, I have been a manager of businesses before as an employee.
employees for corporations, and I knew this was really sideways. I had a lot of red flags about it in the beginning, and I just chalked it up to, oh, they're a different country they don't understand. And I really didn't see Robert or Greg as having any authority. They never, they never made any decision without um, the approval of the the head in New Zealand that we do our best to get is Deborah. Mm -hmm. I don't really know what her name is, there, but she goes by Shalom with yeah. everyone in the community. And um, the well, for instance, I don't even remember if we covered it last time, but the uh, the strange memorabilia, the expensive memorabilia that they buy and have their postal agent store. Like we, they had they brought stuff here. They had some uh, some sort of camera that was a collectible camera from some famous photographer in like the 40s or 30s. I don't even remember his name. That stuff gone. Like they packed it all up from the warehouse. But when Greg very enough, he brought that and told us he didn't know what it was. That she was told him to bring it. And so we left it there, and I messaged her about it, and she said, you just save it. It was very special, and we needed to save it. And she had told us when we very first got here, when we were heading here from uh, Missouri, that there were some very special packages that she wanted me to look for. And so I found it. I sent her a picture of the box and the label, and she was like, yes, yes, that's very special. Just leave it there. And... Um, Greg had opened it during one of his visits, and so I peeked in the box, and I see it is a suit that says it's John Lennon, and it has a, a certificate of history from some law in England, and she had it, she had sent it to Adele Horvath, which I'm guessing is related to Adele Horvath, and she had sent it from New Zealand, and, and later it as mom suit and grandpa suit, but it's clearly memorabilia. When I when I looked it up, but this was before they, they left, but when I started seeing some red flags, I'm like, I want to see what this actually is. And I look up this auction site, and it's some sort of professional auction site with this thing is supposed to be worth over $10,000. I have no, I can't think of any reason why a ministry that to be providing free scriptures to people would need to be purchasing Jalen's memorabilia. Yeah. That makes sense, and that that looks like modeling to me. And I literally saw that suit with my own eyes, and saw the label where she sent it to Adele Horvath. This makes no sense, and she wouldn't give me any answers on it when I asked about. It. Right. Okay. Let's switch the next gears and let's talk about all you know with Bibles and prisoners. And I know that you and Nicole were talking a little earlier, and you have um, like a, a, hand, a handful of letters that they never, ever open. And before we start with that, you know, let me tell everybody out there that um, every postal agent that I have interviewed has always had a story when it comes to prisoners not getting Bibles. All the way back to the original interview I did with Ted Ramp, which was about five or six months ago, he was talking all about that. And everybody all along the way... Always talked about the prisoners. If the prisoners ever got something at all, it was um, it was it was not what they say they are doing. What is your experience? What do you know? And let me know everything if you will, please. Okay. Yes. Uh, in the boxes of the box they were unpacking, uh, there were lots of boxes that were just labeled. They were all really mixed up. Uh, we found out later. Greg was the one who packed for those up in New Jersey. He told us that and stuff. So, and I found a bunch of prisoners' letters. Some of them had been opened. Some of them had stickies on them uh, with notes from previous agents saying um, what to send them or they did send them. And some of them got the free paperback, which what we call the HS standard, which is your, your standard paperback version. Uh, I couldn't find any that had been sent anything beyond a paperback, and most of them were sent a vain tradition. There were notes on them saying things like, if they write again, send them a vain tradition. If they write again, then they can have an HS standard, um, which I thought was strange because we get lots of the, um, the PU, the purple one, they, they get scratched really easily, which anyone who has gotten one of those knows. If you use it very much, it, it shows, shows wear really quick. And she had told us that anything that showed any scratches or damages that couldn't just be wiped off um, with a cloth, as long as it wasn't, as long as it wasn't just dirt, if it was a scratch or whatever, she told us uh, 
step told us to make a separate section or a box of damages, and she said, we will send those to prisoners. And I was like, well, that's good, because we had a lot of the Hebrew English, um, the, the purple ones that had damages on them. And so I told her, I said, our damages, our damage pile is getting kind of big. Do we have any prisoners we can send them to? And she said, no, we didn't. Just hold on to them, which I thought was strange. But, again, we hadn't finished sorting through all the office boxes. So once I find this, these, I'm starting to come across inmate letters in these office boxes, and I'm seeing where inmates were asking for them. That's one of the number one things inmates were asking for was the Hebrew because they were wanting to study. And here we're sitting on, you know, piles of them, and I didn't understand. And I asked her about it, and she just ignored it. She would ignore me completely. And then after all of this, some of the office stuff had just been shoved into the corner because we're running on their hamster wheel. And I start going through, and I find this pouch, like a, a bubble mailer that was stuffed full of inmate letters that have never been opened, and they're all dated from... August of 22 or before, and mm. they're not even open. Mm. Wow. And we personally weren't allowed to send very many prison orders, and we didn't get prison letters sent to us. Greg said that he was the one doing the prison letters, um, but we were still sending out orders, but only when she would send them through the, <clears throat> through the email, and we were required to, this bothered Olivia because uh, she came to me about it. She said that... Uh, they had sent, Shalom had sent her an email saying that we need to print off these receipts showing that the inmate paid $5 and we have to send it out with every single inmate order they, that we put that they paid $5 for it, whatever it was. And that, that bothered Olivia because it's not true, number one. And she said that it had to be done that way because the prisons require it. Well, I used to be a corrections officer. I know that that's not true. Maybe there are some prisons that require a receipt, but they're yeah. not going to stop people from donating to prisoners. That's just not how it works. Right. That's, that's against religious rights. Yep. So I knew that there was something funny with that. I still don't know what that's about, but she does insist that every postal agent include a fake receipt of $5 for every inmate and that we also keep a copy of it and that be like sent to her through email. Anyway, it's... There is no way that the inmates are receiving what they asked for. We got a, we found one letter that had been opened and the man hadn't been responded to, and he actually said in there that he felt like he would have a better chance of getting pardoned by Biden than to get a Hallelujah Scriptures. Mm, wow. Because he had asked so many times. Right. Now, there's an active grift going on with the Hallelujah Scriptures, and they've been pushing for people to try to give them money for stamps. And this is their, their latest um, grift, is they're, they're, they're talking about this. Now, you've run into some letters that you ended you saw stamps in there. Is that correct? Yes. Can you tip? Yes, there were, they were inmates sending stamps in two hallelujah scriptures with their request for free scriptures and and even saying there in little notes like uh you know prayerfully this is enough this prayerfully this is enough to cover postage for what i've asked for so they're they're telling the inmates apparently that they need the postage in order to send them the free scriptures wow and, and so there are some inmates that are under the impression that they have to send their stamps from the, their allotments that they have in prison in order to get these and at the same time, they're, they are basically cheating the body of Messiah by telling them, this is what we need, donate to us so that we can donate to them. And then they're telling the inmates that we need the postage. Like, yep. it, it's crooked all the way around. Yeah, and for anyone who doesn't know about um, inmates is when you when you're in jail, you, you usually get two stamps a week is what you are allotted. And you can, on commissary, you can buy stamps. And it is, it's most, a lot of people are, are really broke. And a lot of people aren't able to afford it. And so if you're able, if, if an inmate sends you stamps, that is essentially like gold. That is their, that is a currency in, in the jail. And it is worth everything because that is their, their, their way to communicate. That is, that is everything to them. Yeah. And for them sending the stamps in and for them getting no replies, again, you know, some of the, the people that need these scriptures more than anybody else 
are the inmates, right? The, the, the people who are down on, on their life and down on luck and down on everything. And um, the, what, what a better time to receive um, the, the scriptures. Now, what do you, um, what advice do you have for, twofold question, what advice do you have for people that want to buy a Hallelujah Scriptures? And what I've been telling folks is not to buy from the Hallelujah Scriptures. And, and before, I, before I go into that, let me tell you something you probably do not know. Is Nicole and I and the family, there's five of us have been working on this translation of the Scriptures. That part you do know. But we've also found two other book vendors who are ready to take this manuscript of the Hallelujah Scriptures and they're going to bring this book to life in the next couple of months. A brand new version of that is not labeled under the Hallelujah Scriptures, but it will have everything that we currently have. Now, what advice do you have for people that deal, that still believe that the Hallelujah Scriptures is legit? And what advice do you have for postal agents and people that are involved in, in this kind of what they believe is a ministry? I would advise people to follow what the Torah says and diligently search the matter out. Um, I don't want them to accept my word or anyone's word for it, but to search it out and look at the evidence. I know you've been able to compile a lot of the evidence. I personally um, came across the witness of Ted Ramp and some others back in 2013. I did not diligently search it out. I was like, oh, this is just somebody trying to trying to stop the ministry, and I did not look diligently for the document that Ted Ramp had put together so well. I have read it all since then, and I continued for a decade to support them, and I, I personally love the Hallelujah Scriptures, but that's because it's, it's Yah's Word. I don't like this organization. I love His Word. Right. Whatever form that comes in, whatever color the cover is, I don't care about any of that. His word is what is important, and they they are they are going against the Father. They are stealing people's money. There is abundant proof of it, and my advice is before sending them a dime, please do the due diligence as the word instructs us to do, and listen to the witnesses and look at the evidence. And pray about it, honestly. Really pray about it, because... You will be taking part in the illegal activities by funding them. That's what broke my heart when I when I saw some of the evidence that I've seen, some of the evidence that you guys have brought forth also and that Ted Ramp has brought forth. I I cried. I I felt terrible because I did not search it out back in twenty thirteen like I should have. Hmm. Wow. All right. Now B I wanna switch gears to you personally here in just a second. So let's let's wrap up with anything that has to do with Hallelujah Scriptures, anything that you want to get off your chest, anything that you have for the people, anything at all that is out there? I would like to let it be known to anyone who is interested in what's going on with this. And um, I know that one of the questions that I would have is oh, Hold on just a second, Trish. Just a second. You're, you're, you're breaking up. Let's, let's get you back. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, can you restart that, that, what you just said? That was really breaky. Okay. Um, basically, if, if I were looking at this from the outside, I would want to know more about the contract situation, so I'd like to explain and address that, that the contract that my children and I signed with them, I want to be very clear that I would not have normally allowed my children to sign a contract if I thought that it was going to be going to court because they're underage except for the oldest. And the only reason I agreed to that was that while on the phone with this Deborah calling herself Shalom, she, I told her, I said, I don't think my children can sign this contract. They're too young. And she said, oh, no, no, it's not what it's for. It's, it's just for the body, like it's to show our agreement in case there's ever a problem because we've had problems with other people. It's not for man's court. It's for the assembly of Yah. And I was like, okay, so that's why I agreed to it. And now here we sit with them taking us to court over this and trying to bring my children into court for a contract that is ridiculous. I did I wouldn't have signed it. I did sign it under duress because it wasn't meant to be a legal document. It was meant to be an agreement before the assembly that we would do our part. Right. And that we were serving.
serving Yah and not man, and that's why we agreed to it. Um, so I just want to cover that for anyone who might have any questions as to why I would have allowed my children to sign this contract. That's why. Is it was just for me, and my understanding with her verbally was that this was just for us stating before the assembly that we are agreeing to serve Yah to the best of our ability in the postal agent position. Right. Okay. Um, beautiful on this. Now, I, I, let's let's switch gear to a little bit of, of I guess, more, more personal stuff for, for you on this side. Because the other day, Nicole was talking to me, and she said that you were essentially at a food bank. That you were essentially at a, a, a I guess it's, it's a place for people without food. And can you tell me about your current situation? How are you guys doing? What are you doing? You're in a house right now that these people, you know, when I, when I read these legal paperwork that they're sending against you, I, I, I am, I am blown away that she is trying to sue you guys for $4,000 for the power bill. When the power bill, yeah. it was very clear from the bank statements that I saw myself, the power bill never reached over $500 in the month when it was being used the very most. So I'm very perplexed that she is trying to now sue you guys who are homeless, who she's trying to, that you, you, and you know, for those who do not know, Trish is out in the middle of, I don't know where she's at, but she's out in the middle of nowhere. And there's, there's not a town close by. There's not, she doesn't have a working vehicle. It has been a struggle going from place to place and trying to battle these people that are trying to attack and hurt her family far worse than they are already hurting her, especially when she's having problems already within this house that are, it's just unbelievable the kind of evil that is happening against you. How, what are your plans and how, how are you, what are you, how are you making this, I guess, is my question. Well, uh, this is... Hang on, Trish. Hang on, Trish. You just broke up. Start, start again, please. All right, hold on, Trish. I, I lost you. If you can hear me, hang tight, everybody. There we go. Okay, well, I got you back. Okay, we do. We do have some food. Um, but we also do some foraging. But we have a neighbor who offered to take me to the food bank. He hasn't actually been able to do that yet. He started a new job, and his cousin, his cousin is our closest neighbor. That's how he found out about us and tried. He tried to help us. We've been able to go to town a couple of times, uh, but it, it's very difficult because of the schedule that they work. Um, the reason the closest neighbor said that Greg and David tried to bribe her uh, and offered to pay her money to try to get scriptures out of us and I guess to try to see if we were holding back any stocks that they were unaware of and he anyway she said that he seemed like he was on something she, she thought that he was on some sort of drugs and she didn't she didn't know what to think about it but it just she said she saw some red flags so she came to check on us and it's those neighbors that have they brought us food um, once and then offered to take us to the food um, we've also been attempting to get on uh, Food stamps, we don't have that yet. We should have it um, soon. So we're managing. Like, the father always provides, but definitely, we've definitely been put in a spot. <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. Right, absolutely. And for those who do not know, Trish is in, in Arkansas, and so if there's brothers or sisters in Arkansas that are close by, we're always looking for some sort of an assistance. And um, Trish... Your, your plans going forward, I, I guess that, that's going to be, you won't really know because, you know, you have a court date, you have no place to go, and, yeah, and you know, it's, it's, it's almost like a catch-22. It's like they almost got you between a rock and a hard place, and, you know, I, you know the last thing I want to do is, is see you um, in the streets, and do you guys have plans, or are you guys going to be staying in Arkansas, or... You know, just for those who have helped and, and donated, wh where are you trying to get to? Well, that's a big question, Mark. Uh, we we want to be wherever the Father wants us. Wherever that is, we're fine with. Uh, we don't, it's kind of hard for us to make plans because I can't drive <laughs> mm -hmm. and my vehicle isn't legal mm -hmm. and it's got mechanical issues now. I don't know what it is, but, but, but we can't. <laughs> We have animals, like they, they were telling us to start a homestead, so we've got like a flock of quail that we had already got the eggs and had them incubated according to her instructions. Like we, we have animals that we're dealing with, flocks that we're dealing with, 
gardening. We, we've continued to get word on all of the homesteading side of our contracts, but we don't know, like, we don't know where we could go and without getting rid of, we also have pets. Like, all of my kids have animals. We've got cats and dogs. We, I, I truly don't know. I don't know where we would go that we would be able to. There's other stuff that I can't get into having to do with the emergency with my oldest that, that also complicates matters on where we can go. Um, it's not like we can just go stay in a spare room or pop up a tent in their yard. Like we would be bringing the zoo and complications with us that, that um, I don't know. I really don't know. I would be I would be literally in if it wasn't for y'all and all of the situations that he's brought us through. Mm-hmm. Um, the piece that I have right now definitely surpasses on getting and we trust him um, completely. And I I know that there have been a couple of people who have reached out and said, Hey, you know, you can come stay with us but it's and we, we love we love that. We appreciate everyone who has um, offered that we can, you know, stay with them if we if we can get to them kind of a thing. But we will if we have to leave here right now, we will literally be on foot. <laughs> like hurting our animals on with, foot. Like that's a, all Yeah, with a caravan it, it reminds me of a second exodus. You'll have to go slow because you'll have all the animals. Oh, no. Now, you, yeah. you ended up where you are at and the situation you are in because you were told that there was a long-term residence, there was sh- there was basically everything that you were wanting to do, like homesteading. You know, I've been through the contracts, and, you know, for those, again, who want to see more on this, check out the first version of this, the, the, the part one, and we go into a lot of this. Um, Trish, I... Uh, you know, I, I really, I really, really appreciate your strength. I really, really appreciate you and your family. I appreciate everything that you guys have done. And, um, you know, for anybody that is out there that is able to help Trisha and her family, I will leave a, a GoFundMe link at the bottom. And the funds that came in, I can tell you they were used for miracles. And had you guys out there not been following the hand of Yah and taking care of our fellow people and taking care of us, I know that Trish and her family would be very, very far worse off than what they are right now. So thank you from everybody on, you know, from, from me and my channel and my family. I thank you guys very, very much because I, I made the call out to people of Yah. And I know the people of Yah have good hearts. I know they do not want to see this evil happening. I know they do not want people hurt. And this is what we're trying to prevent. And so, Trish, I want to thank you very, very much. Um, and, you know, you have all love from our family on all of this. Is there anything else you want to tell the people before we roll off? Thank you. Thank you to you guys, to everyone who has helped your prayers. Everyone's prayers, we can feel them. It, and it, you're right. It, the, it was a miracle what, what we were able to do with the funds that came in. My... One of my children. Hold on, Trish. Hold on, Tr- Trish. Hold on, real quick. You said you you it broke up at one of your children. Can you repeat that, please? Yes, one of my children would have been harmed even worse than what has already happened. Uh, I, someday, someday, everyone will be able to understand. I pray, but it it has been a true miracle in my. One of my children, thanks now, thanks to everyone's um, donations from before, and I that that means more to me than anything. Yep, yep. All right. Well, Miss um, Trish Elliott and everybody out there, this is uh, Mrs. Trish Elliott. She is a warrior for our our father. She has been doing everything that she possibly can. She got her family into a lot of trouble trying to serve our father, and this is where she is at. Trish, much love to you, dear sis. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. All right. Much love. Yep. All right.